Thanks, thanks, Nat. Uh, it's great to be here, and thank you very much for coming along. Uh, you're all facing away from this mirror, but I'm kind of looking at it. And <laughs> if you're a politician, it's just impossible, right? <laughs> Look at yourself. So I'll try not to be too distracted. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, uh, this is the first time I've given this talk, so this is a good thing because it means I'll be really fresh, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. This is a part of a campaign that we're launching this year. Um, we haven't actually done the official launch for it. This is the first time we've done this PowerPoint slide about it. Uh, so but the, the, uh, the big story, obviously, is that climate change is the giant issue facing the human race um, over the course of uh, this century and over the course of the next few decades. Um, it will be the defining issue uh, of our lifetime um, and of our kids' lifetimes. Uh, and how we respond to climate change, uh, that is both how we mitigate, that is how we reduce our emissions, but also how we adapt, because this thing's already underway, um, is going to be one of the defining issues of this century. And really sustainability, more broadly conceived, uh, will be one of the, if not the dominant issue of this century. And those who can get their head around sustainability and understand it and respond to it are going to be the heroes of this century. And I hope that many of us in this room will be amongst that group uh, because we need some heroes because <laughs> we've got some big problems. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, problem. There we go. Look at that. I, I prepared. Uh, problem. <laughs> All right. So we've got a problem and this is a, it's climate change, right? So. I've got, I've got a design team, right? So this is the designers I've come up with this. <clears throat> you can't see the writing? That's very good feedback. I'll pass that on to Amanda. Um, so obviously climate change is going to affect everything. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but as we know, it's extreme weather events, it's rising sea levels, it's going to affect food production, it's going to affect the whole kit and caboodle. This is a major transformation. You know, we've gone through the Holocene period, you know, this incredibly stable climate since the last ice age, which, under which, you know, human civilization has evolved. And then through our inputs, we're destabilizing this fantastically stable system that we were lucky enough to, um, to, to, to evolve in. Some of our, uh, obviously our native flora and fauna are gonna be affected. Um, this is the uh, <coughs> fauna. That, and um, so, so they're going to be affected because some of their food sources are going to be affected, but also, as we know with the tuatara, it's also about, um, you know, over a certain temperature, the, the gender of the eggs changes and so forth. So it's not only going to affect us, um, if, if you have a kind of a, a, a green-centric view of the world, you don't just care about people, you also care about all the other amazing living things um, that we share the planet with. And ever since the last great extinction event um, at the end of the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago, there's been this incredible blossoming of, of life on Earth. And so the danger and the fear, I guess, for, for those of us who love this incredible blossoming is that we'll go through another extinction event. Um, the, you know, we've had extinction events in the past. You know, they do happen. <laughs> But usually last time it was because an asteroid hit the Earth, right? Um, this time, it, it, if there's going to be an extinction event, it's going to be because of our impact. And obviously the sea level rise is the really wild card in all of this has in terms of human civilization, because so many of us live around the sea and so many of our giant, incredible cities have been built by the sea. So sea level ri rise will have a dramatic impact, but it's a real wild card because it all depends on how fast the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are destabilized. And that's quite an unknown factor still, is how fast those giant ice sheets are being destabilized. We certainly know they are being destabilized, there's no question about that. It's just a question of how fast they're going to move um, will have a dramatic impact on our experience of climate change because sea level rise will be very visible and very noticeable to everybody. Now, of course, the insurance industry, are the, which are the people who are paid by within capitalism, whose job it is, is to look forward into the future, are incredibly worried about climate change. And they keep shouting about it a lot. Um, this is just one example, but they're, they're really shouting about climate change because they're saying, we can't afford to bail out some of these events. Um, we just don't have the reinsurance funds to pay for it. <clears throat> yeah, it's going to have, a, have an impact on food production in a number of ways. Um, so you get these more extreme weather events, you get more droughts, um, but of course you also get more rain, more extreme rainfall events, so you get these flood events, and both of them are enormously destructive. 
And it's, you know, when you have one of these events, you know, every 10 years or so, then, you know, it's not a big deal. You can recover from it. You know, we've, you know, we've got a lot of resource. The problem is, is they start to accumulate one on top of the other on top of the other. I mean, you think about a country like Vanuatu gets hit by a big storm. Okay, if it's got another 30 years before it gets hit by a storm of that magnitude again, it's got time to recover and rebuild. It's a poor country, but, you know, they can do it. Um, it starts to happen more frequently and it gets very difficult to rebuild between each of the extreme weather events. And of course for a country like New Zealand or the United States which has more resource, um, it, you know, we've got more resilience but um, you know, the, the, it gets pretty expensive. And then the frost issues. <clears throat> and then of course there's the global health issues um, which is partly to do with the spread of infectious vectors um, like mosquitoes. So mosquitoes obviously as vectors of infectious diseases, their, their range increases as the, as the planet warms. <clears throat> so that's the kind of, the, we've been experimenting a lot with um, how you communicate climate change. <clears throat> so one of the ways you communicate climate change is you try to say it's really bad, right? So that's the that bit, right? <laughs> um, but the question is, does that really work? I mean, it might work for people like us, right? Because we kind of like, you know, we're really interested in, in understanding what's going on. But we also think that in terms of communicating about climate change, we also need to give a positive story as well. It can't just all be doom and gloom, because if you just do doom and gloom, um, people, understandably, kind of turn off. So there's a question about <clears throat> the transition that we're going through. We know um, that some of the really interesting things that are happening in terms of clean energy are really amazing. Um, so photovoltaics and the cost of, of renewable generation has just plummeted. Um, partly through what's happened in Germany with the big expansion there, also partly what happened in China with the big expansion there. But, we, but with the development of technology and mass production, the good thing is that it's pretty price competitive. Um, and this is kind of a bunch of really good things that are going on. <laughs> over. Um, so for example, in 2013 um, was the first time that we built more non-fossil than fossil generation in the world. Um, so slightly more non-fossil generation was built in 2013 globally than fossil generation. That's the first time that's happened in, I don't know, maybe ever, um, maybe a couple hundred years. Uh, now I should, should say that that non-fossil generation includes nuclear, um, so uh, there's a bit of an issue about that, but in general it's heading in the right direction in a number of places. Um, it's actually a pretty good story in a lot of ways. Uh, there's also enormous problems as well, but there are some really positive signs about what's happening. Uh, and we know that people are really waking up. I mean, there was a, <clears throat> I saw a poll just today which said the majority of Americans now support a carbon tax. Uh, so, you know, there is movement in, in, the, in, in many countries around the world which have been quite problematic um, towards taking action on climate change. And this is one of my favourite stories is the Rockefeller Brothers Fund um, divested from fossil fuels. This is one of the um, number of funds, the kind of family trusts that got the Rockefeller money. Um, and so this particular family trust, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, decided that they didn't want to invest in fossil fuels anymore. And that they said if the, if the Rockefellers had been around now, they wouldn't either because fossil fuels are like the history. <clears throat> and, and this meeting between Xi Jinping and uh, Barack Obama was, um, you know, it's not perfect, uh, but at least it's saying, the United States is saying, the President's saying, you know, my objective is a reduction. He's going to have a bit of a problem with Congress, obviously, in achieving that reduction. Um, Xi Jinping saying peak by 2030. It's probably actually going to peak by 2020. On current projections, China, last year China used less coal than the previous years, first time ever. So they appear to have gone past the point of peak coal, um, which is a really, really good sign. It's driven partly by climate change, but also by the concern about particulates, you know, smog in the air that comes from coal. Um, but it is happening. Um, and the really, some, another interesting thing happened in 2014, the, the um, International Energy Agency put a report out a couple of weeks ago which showed that carbon emissions coming out of the energy sector um, actually stalled in 2014. So even though globally the GDP increased, in 2014 the carbon emissions coming out of energy flatlined. 
So it's a very interesting, it plays into the argument about whether you can have GDP growth while reducing greenhouse emissions as well, which is a very interesting argument. Um, and for those who think you can break the two apart, um, they've used this obviously as, um, as an argument to support that line of reasoning. It's, a, it's part of the very interesting debate. But where you, whether, whether, you, whether you support that argument or not, the fact that GDP grew while energy emissions um, were flatlined is a positive sign, no question about it. <coughs> And so New Zealand can play its part in this. Um, obviously we're a small country, but um, just being small doesn't mean you can't play your part in it. And certainly in the past, um, we've done some really great things. Uh, New Zealand, you know, the, the nuclear free, voting for women, and you know, the initial emissions trading scheme did have all sectors in it, even though it's quite problematic. Um, <laughs> that's, this is Simon, who ended up being one of our staffers. This is um, the giving out the Fossil of the Day Award at one of the climate change meetings internationally. New Zealand got a whole bunch of these Fossil of the Day Awards, particularly under the current government, um, as they kind of turned it around. And so here's a bunch of things where the current government is really just heading in the wrong direction. I mean, this will come as no surprise to anyone here, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, the, the emissions trading scheme has been absolutely gutted. We've been taking these um, credits from offshore um, that no one else in the world's really using anymore because they're so bunkum. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Ah, yeah. I can, I can. So the, the top one is about the emissions trading scheme. The next one's about fuel economy standards for the vehicle fleet, which could make a very significant difference. Um, the next one's about subsidising dairy intensification. And I see fed farmers um, have just called out for more subsidies for dairy intensification. Um, <clears throat> the next one's about um, the, the car fleet and not moving away from fossil fuels in the car fleet. And I'll just talk about that in a minute because there's some very interesting things happening in electrification. Uh, the next one's about refusing to set mandatory targets for greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and then the other one's about uh, risky oil exploration, so there's significant subsidies going into fossil fuel um, exploration in New Zealand. Um, we just had the, the, the paradox of, of, the, um, of the Minister for Climate Change calling on other countries to remove their fossil fuel subsidies. Um, of course, New Zealand subsidises the fossil fuel industry quite significantly. Um, and then we've got the whole decision to invest in motorways ahead of um, sustainable transport options. And um, then there's about the energy company privatisations. <clears throat> this is kind of the, the mega picture of where we're going. This is from the government's own, own um, analysis. Um, this is where we said we should be going, and this is where we're going. This is, this is net emissions. And so our net emissions are projected to increase quite significantly over the next decade, um, and, and whereas we, we're trying to reduce them. This is being driven by a large part by the collapse in the price of carbon, which has meant that forestry companies are cutting down trees and not replanting because the, the, the price on carbon has disappeared. And then in terms of our uh, other emissions, are, are flatlining at the moment. Right. Solution. <laughs> yeah, these, these are also quite small. Um, <laughs> so this is very good, this is good feedback, thank you. Um, so the first thing we're saying is, look, you, basically you need to have a price on carbon, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, every really, you know, I, I think it's really clear that you do need a price on carbon to drive um, the transfer to low emissions um, economy. We're saying establish a climate commission who can provide independent advice on it, a green investment bank, um, which is of course what David Cameron in the United Kingdom did. He established put three billion pounds into a green investment bank to drive um, renewable generation. It's why they've had such a big boom in offshore wind. Uh, the green investment bank's been one of the key drivers of that, amongst others. Um, there's about alternatives to the to um, the <coughs> motorways. Um, that's the fourth one there. Renewable electricity. We're kind of in a pretty privileged position whereby we could move towards 100% renewable pretty easily. Um, fuel economy standards, uh, reprioritising transport investment. We did this um, during the election campaign, we did a, a budget where we took all the money they were planning to spend on transport and simply reprioritised it. Um, so we didn't say we're going to spend any more, um, it's just we spend it on other things. Um, because they're spending so much money on new motorways, there's actually like a massive $20 billion pot of money and um, whereby if you wanted to, if you had the right government in place, you could make a tremendous difference um, to New Zealand's transport system, a phenomenal difference. And the last one's about deep sea oil drilling, um, because obviously the government's very keen on deep sea oil drilling. Some of the areas that they just can, said that um, you can do exploratory wells in are more than twice as deep as the deep water horizon um, well in the Gulf of Mexico. Right? That was about 1,500 metres deep. Some, they just approved um, one of the companies to drill at 3,200 um, metres under, under the water. 
Obviously, if something goes wrong at 3,200 metres, it's pretty difficult to get down there and fix it, um, as BP found out um, with Deepwater Horizon. <clears throat> um, I'll just talk about one particular element of it, which is uh, around the tax system. So uh, what we said was, let's get rid of the emissions trading scheme because it's, it's manifestly failing um, as a system, and just re go to a simple carbon tax. Uh, so a simple carbon tax, and we'd say basically um, it's $25 a tonne would be your starting point, um, but you say to give the dairy sector a kind of half price to start with, so $12.50 a tonne, and then you do the same for forestry. You say you get $12.50 a tonne for all the carbon you sequestered dairy has to pay. And then the amount of money you raise by doing that, you can actually deliver quite significant income tax cuts um, through this process. So essentially you say it's fiscally neutral, so you put in place a carbon tax and you recycle it into income tax cuts and also cut in the company tax rate. Uh, so that kind of system which has been um, established within Canada, in some states in Canada, um, I think is politically sellable. Um, because obviously people, or, or many people don't like the idea of new taxes, which, you know, understandable. And so what you go is the quid pro quo is, yes, there's a price on carbon, but your first $2,000 of income is tax-free. Um, so that's basically, that's, the, the, the idea is that families get a cut in their income tax cut, uh, which is paid, through, paid for as a result of carbon taxes. So you incentivise the right kind of behaviour, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and all the revenue you get from it, you recycle it back through the tax system. Uh, forestry, you put in place a price on forestry, uh, which would then incentivise the replanting of forests. Um, not only kind of Pinus radiata and plantation forestry, which is one part of it, but also permanent forest sinks. Um, so particularly in terms of protecting biodiversity and highly erodible, um, uh, steep landscapes right across New Zealand, there's real opportunities to put permanent forests on those eroding hillsides, which is native bush, and um, sequester carbon permanently, effectively. And then the other side of it is you put a price on carbon, around $25 a tonne. And then this is the other stuff, which is um, about investing in public transport. So the, the, basically the rail system in New Zealand, currently they're talking about removing electrification from the main trunk line on the North Island, um, uh, which is just like unbelievable. Um, it's like, what century are we in? Uh, and so if you went in the other direction where you said we're going to invest in the rail network, um, and within you know, a very large transport budget there are real opportunities to invest in the rail network, then you can absolutely transform land transport in New Zealand by investing in the rail network. The other part of it that's kind of really interesting um, is electric vehicles. And you know, our focus is more on public transport, walking and cycling, compact urban form, all that kind of stuff. But obviously people are still going to be using vehicles. So the opportunities around electric vehicles are really amazing, um, particularly for a country like New Zealand which has an isolated grid. I mean, we just can't um, call on the French nuclear power stations, as the Germans can do, um, to supplement our renewable electricity. Um, so the idea of distributed storage, which is what electric vehicles can become part of, actually adds great resilience to the grid um, and is an opportunity to reduce our greenhouse emissions and, incredibly, to source our transport energy domestically. So instead of paying $8 billion a year for imported oil, we could actually source our transport energy in New Zealand um, through renewable electricity. We also have, you know, the way the renewable electricity system works is often at night time or whatever, you get wind blowing, you've got geothermal units which can never be turned off, they go all the time. Um, what do you do with all that power? And one place you can put that power is into the, the batteries of electric vehicles. And then there's the stuff around safe to school. Um, the number of kids that, you know, walk and cycle to school has dropped dramatically. One of the key drivers of that is parents um, are concerned about the safety of kids riding their bikes or walking. You can invest in a, a system of bike networks to completely turn that around um, within the existing transport budget. And <laughs> so this is, um, this is Auckland and Wellington transport plans. So this is about improving public transport in those two urban centres. And we got one for Christchurch as well. The other part of it is the Green Investment Bank. When I went and saw the Green Investment Bank, what really struck me with those people is um, it's, it's, it's very, very um, mainstream in the UK now. Um, you know, they're engaging in very large projects. Um, and they just see that as just business as usual. This is the way of the future. We are going to invest in renewable generation and it's going to overtake the old system. So, of course, you raise this in New Zealand and it's, you know, the devil incarnate. Um, you know, uh, but uh, in the UK and elsewhere, it's just standard practice now. 
there's the great there's solar in schools is another little initiative which is great because um you know people that when you're at school uh, you're using electricity during the day so it's a perfect fit and it means that effectively once you put the panels on the roof of, of the of the of the school then it's like effectively permanently increasing their operating budget by cutting their electricity bills forever as well as being a great educational thing <clears throat> This is what we're part of. What what is the focus for this year for our campaign? Is the Paris meeting? Um, so this meeting, you know, you, you, these meetings can be a source of great distress um, because you know they the people because uh, we hang a lot on them and then they don't work. Um, and hopefully this one won't be like that. Uh, but nonetheless, it is going to be a very important meeting. The good thing is there's a lot of global momentum now in a way that there wasn't for Copenhagen uh, towards this meeting. So it's looking heaps more positive. It doesn't look like it from Australia and New Zealand, to be honest. I mean, we kind of sit in Australia and New Zealand and we kind of think, oh, well, nobody cares about climate change. Look at our governments. Um, we've got Tony Abbott and John Key in the country. Is he still in the country? Um, <clears throat> he, he was telling us today, oh, Tony Abbott is, you know, he's really funny, right? He tells us today, yes, it's the war against ISIS is going to be as successful as Gallipoli. It's like, yep, you might have a point. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I paraphrase, I paraphrase. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, but it, it, it kind of doesn't look like it from Australia and New Zealand, but the world is really moving on climate change. This is really big now, um, and so it's quite hopeful. So our campaign is, is this year is, is, you know, I think there's a great appetite amongst New Zealanders, if not in the New Zealand government, to take action on climate change. Part of the reason why the government has to repeatedly try to confuse people as to the facts of what's going on in New Zealand on climate change is New Zealanders don't want to be part of the problem on greenhouse emissions, but we are because we have a government that won't take action, so our net emissions have increased dramatically. Um, and so I, I think New Zealanders want to be part of the solution. So we're trying to break this kind of cycle of, of lack of action by intervening as a political party, but also intervening with all the NGOs, because there's lots of great non-government organisations who are engaged in the climate space as well. <clears throat> and part of that is about trying to reframe the debate in terms of positive messages. So as you saw in, in my presentation there, um, uh, it's about, you know, it's not just gloom and doom. There are lots of great things happening and there's lots of opportunities as well to embrace a, a low carbon economy and a low carbon future. Um, trying to mobilise supporters to become advocates, climate advocates in their communities around the country and also opinion formers, because we we're trying to reach out to opinion formers, but also and then increase the public noise around climate change over the course of the year. And that's part of what we'll be doing over the course of this year. Yeah. yeah. Oh, slightly um, all right, so this is it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so if you want to get involved, uh, if this is something that you want to put some um, attention into, um, you can go to this website or write your name down on the thing that just went around. And you can be, uh, you know, actual, if you want to engage more actively on the climate issues, um, this is your opportunity to do that. So we'll be, we'll be working both um, as the Green Party in terms of mobilising a campaign around the climate, but we'll also be working with the rest of the NGOs in the climate space, particularly as we get closer to the Paris meeting. Um, in trying to increase the pressure on the New Zealand government. So that's it. <clears throat>